Well, thank you, Yasmina, for uh, that introduction and for um, inviting us to share our um, work today and uh, the epitope mapping of human antibodies from transgenic chickens. And hopefully this will provide a, a real world example of how we've used the Cartera high throughput um, SPR instrument um, in our work. So I'm from, actually we, we say Ligand Pharmaceuticals, some say Ligand. Um, and at Ligand Pharmaceuticals, um, we have a suite of transgenic animals that produce human variable region antibodies. So we have the Omni rat and the Omni mouse for uh, d drug discovery of uh, standard monoclonal antibodies. We have the Omni flick, which has a fixed light chain, which can be used for developing bispecific antibodies. And we have the Omni chicken platform, um, which I'm going to talk to you about today. So you may ask, why use chickens for human antibody discovery? Chickens um, are, by the fact that they're more evolutionarily distant from humans compared to mice, will give a, uh, a stronger immune response to um, human-derived target proteins. So not only will they give a stronger response than a mouse might, but they also um, would have further epitope um, accessibility. So some epitopes that may be completely conserved between humans and mice may not be conserved in chickens and therefore in the chicken orthologue of that protein, and therefore those epitopes will be accessible in chickens. And last but perhaps most importantly is that if you use the chicken as the, uh, the, the immunization host, you can derive antibodies that are cross-reactive to the mouse orthologue of your human target. And so this allows you to create antibodies that um, can be used in preclinical animal studies and move seamlessly into clinical work um, without, uh, without the need for surrogate antibodies. So we have, we can use wild type chickens to make antibodies, but in order to not have to do humanization, we have genetically engineered chickens to express human variable regions. So the strategy that we took was based on the fact that wild type chickens have a single variable region framework for the heavy chain and a single one for the light chain. So we thought um, that we would mimic this and uh, use the power of the chicken immune system to, um, to our advantage. So we knocked in to the, um, so on this slide we're showing the, uh, the heavy chain locus and we knocked into the heavy chain locus um, here, the human heavy chain, and we've, we've chosen a single framework, um, single human framework, and we selected uh, VH323 for this. So the way that chickens produce uh, sequence diversity in their antibodies is by a process of gene conversion, which takes sequences from upstream pseudogenes that are upstream of the single functional V, and in an iterative process of gene conversion, uh, in, in the somatic, in the B cells, um, you produce uh, diversity through gene conversion. So these, these pseudogenes upstream um, it, in our human transgene have been designed to have diversity only in the CDRs. So these pseudogenes have frameworks that are, that are identical to the single functional V, so that we're only encouraging diversity in the CDR sequences of, our, um, of the antibodies that are made by the B cells. We have two heavy chain transgenes. One has a pre-rearranged functional V, and the other one has a um, germline v, VH gene, all of the human Ds, and a single um, JH gene. And the functional V region is produced by um, VDJ recombination. Um, I, lastly, I should just point out that these, the, v, the V regions are splicing to the endogenous downstream con chicken constant regions. On the light chain, we have essentially the same situation. We, um, the chicken light chain, the chicken has one light chain, but we have knocked in um, either a kappa, and we've chosen V kappa 315, or a lambda, um, V lambda 144, into the chicken light chain locus. And we're using the same pseudogenes upstream to produce genetic diversity uh, in the CDRs of the expressed functional Vs. 
So by simple reading, we've combined all of these transgenes in, very, in all the different potential combinations. And um, so we've made the pre-rearranged heavy chain with either the kappa or the lambda, and the rearranging heavy chain with either the kappa or the lambda. And um, sort of the, the main gist of the rest of the talk is how we've used the uh, Cartera instrument to characterize the different antibody panels that come out of all these different um, transgenic strains. So we've used a model antigen for all these studies, uh, and that is human progranulin. Progranulin is a multi-subunit protein um, which enables us to uh, easily parse out where our antibodies are binding in the protein. So um, it, it's, it's a good model to, to be able to compare epitope coverage between the different host genotypes. Progranulin is highly immunogenic in both chickens and mice, but we previously previously published that we found um, chickens recognize additional epitopes that were not found in the previous mouse immunizations. Um, the omni chickens that are expressing human antibodies have also been found to retain a chicken-like epitope recognition, in which we published that last year. So um, as I'm going to show you, we've also found that um, alternative patterns and distribution of epitope binning have been found in the different genotypes. So first, we, we immunized um, our omni chickens. And here's a serum titer of progranulin immunized kappa birds and lambda birds. So kappa on the left, lambda on the right. And um, after we get, um, after we usually boost three or four times, and we get a sufficient titer, we then harvest the spleen cells. And since there's no hybridoma partner in, that's available in chickens. We instead have a single B cell cloning method that we use called the gem assay. I don't really have time to describe further, but suffice it to say that we can get, um, we can get our clones out of the animal using the gem assay. So from each genotype, we usually, um, or from each bird, we might get anywhere from 10 to 50 unique sequence antibodies. We like to collect panels of maybe about 100 antibodies for screening and for their characterization on the CAR-TR instrument. So here is the results from a cohort of kappa antibodies that we ran on the, the CAR-TR instrument. And it's looking at the epitope binning um, of these antibodies. So you can see that the antibodies fall into um, epitope bins based on their um, cross-blocking cross um, activity. Um, and from previous work, we know that um, we have reference antibodies to all the different subdomains of the progranulin protein. So we include, the, include those reference antibodies in the, binning, the big binning experiment. And then it allows us to identify which, um, which subdomains each of these bins belongs to. We can also look at this, this nodal plot and um, and we can see where, where there's asymmetric binding of an antibody pair. So um, if sometimes the antibody that's bound to the chip will block binding to the target of the second antibody, but not in the other oriented, not in the reverse uh, situation. So um, we can also see this in the nodal plots. So here I'm showing pie charts of the binning distribution from 101 um, unique sequence kappa antibodies are from the kappa birds and 168 antibodies from the lambda containing birds. And um, the first point is that both of these um, show that we hit every subdomain of the progranulin protein in both of these birds. Uh, but the second thing is that you can immediately see that the, the distribution is not the same. So notably, the green or the G subdomain of progranulin was uh, much more um, hit much more often by the lambda birds than the kappa birds. And concomitantly, the kappa had a lot more of the CD subdomain than the lambda did. So it's an interesting observation that, that we can run these binning experiments on the Cartera instrument and just quickly see um, differences in our different genotypes that, that may be interesting and may be um, something you can follow up on. We also have the sequence of all of our uh, monoclonal antibodies. And here is 
showing a sequence dendrogram mapping to the binning data. So the binning data is the first column next to the sequence dendrogram. And um, the first thing that you might notice is that many related clones that are similarly, um, or that are related in sequence, hit the same bins. So that's probably not surprising. But what we also see is that um, the same bin can be hit by completely unrelated antibodies. So that would just indicate that we have enough diversity in our birds that we can get unrelated clones to hit the same epitope or same bin. Um, I also uh, like to, th this, the second column here points out that um, we have, in this cohort, 28% of the antibodies are cross-reactive to the mouse ortholog. And these birds were not immunized with the mouse, nor were they screened for mouse. Um, so this is just the naturally occurring percentage of mouse cross-reactivity. And the last column is, the, uh, is showing the kinetics, so the, um, the binding affinities for all these clones. And um, you can see that there's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna show a little bit more later, but you can basically just see that there's a range of kinetics um, throughout all of the different sequences. Um, and I guess I should say at the beginning, this is, this is from the lambda with the pre-rearranged heavy chain. So um, similarly with uh, another group of clones from the lambda light chain with the rearranging heavy chain, uh, in this case we saw a large cohort of antibodies that are somewhat related, binding to the G domain, um, and, then, um, and then others as well. So these birds actually had a lot more mouse cross-reactive um, clones, of about 59% were mouse cross-reactive. Uh, so um, for the kappa, we did the same analysis and, um, and found similar results. The one thing I did want to point out, however, is that the mouse cross-reactivity sometimes, um, for example, these two clones, they are related clones, yet one is mass react reactive and the other cross reactive and the other is not. So apparently, small changes in the antigen binding um, part of the antibody can lead to a change in whether it binds mass cross reactivity or reactively or not. So talking about the sequences a little bit more, I just wanted to show. Um, plots of the sequence diversity that we find in our antibodies. So these are sequence plots across the light chain variable region or the heavy chain variable region from 98 monoclonals from a uh, lambda uh, light chain with the rearranging heavy chain. So you can clearly pick out the CDRs because those are where most of the diversity is occurring. Um, each position is shown with um, the colored bar is showing which amino acids are uh, changed versus the germline sequence in those, that position. So the frameworks um, have very little changes. Uh, most of the frameworks have very few changes. So this is the way we like to think that the, um, the antibodies then give you all of the diversity and epitope binning and kinetic diversity that you want, but only with CDRs uh, diversity and frameworks that are preferred or desired frameworks for downstream uh, manufacturing. So here's an ISO affinity plot um, showing the, the on rates on the y-axis and the off rates on the x-axis for comparing 63 kappa clones in the blue dots uh, versus 136 lambda clones in the red dots. And on the diagonal, diagonal lines are the, um, the binding affinities. So we see that um, a good proportion of clones are sub-nanomolar, and indeed um, quite a few are in the double-digit picomolar as well. I also just wanted to show a few examples of the um, sensorgrams for some of these. And I just picked out a very few, uh, just six from, um, from one bird, and these are happen to be very fast on-rate clones, and these are all for that are specific for the E subdomain of progranulin, which um, we don't really have an explanation for, but 
we consistently see that clones binding to the sub e subdomain have very fast on rates. These clones, however, have varying off rates so that the, sub the, um, the binding affinities can vary from less than 19 picomolar to 88 nanomolar. So that's all I was going to say about um, the Cartera analysis of all our um, antibodies. And now I was going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, humanness of our antibodies. So even though we look at our antibody sequences and there are no obvious chicken sequences in there, um, people still ask the question, how, how human are your antibodies and what's the potential for immunogenicity? So we took three, uh, three tacks to this, to this question. Um, the first is we went to Epivax and asked whether uh, we could predict the in silico immunogenicity of our antibody panels. And um, Epivax evaluates the T cell epitope and T regitope content of your sequence. And um, we compared the scores that we got from our antibodies to scores of randomly sourced human, sourced from humans sequences. Um, and we did this for both the heavy chain and the light chain, light chains. We also then looked at, uh, with BISC Global, we looked at um, grand average of hydropathy, gravy, and uh, several other physiochemical properties. And um, this is all, again, just in silico predictions. And we compared heavy chain sequences to um, human sourced sequences. And lastly, we did the Lake Pharma T20 algorithm and um, compared our omni sequences through their algorithm. So Epivax takes your sequence and scans the whole sequence for uh, the nine mer peptides that would um, potentially bind to uh, the, most of the major HLA types in the human population. And they get a score for each peptide in your, your protein um, that's based on empirical data that they've developed in their own database. So they have a, um, the raw score is based on just all of these T cell epitopes. They then, they know that some of these epitopes are actually T regitopes, and so they adjust the raw score by subtracting um, a, another number, a score that they get that's, that's based on the T regitope that would be serving to um, uh, reduce immunogenicity of your antibody. So then you end up with an adjusted score. So on this slide is the analysis we did on our heavy chain sequences, and on the left, are the Epi, uh, Epivax raw scores in blue and T regitobe adjusted scores in green for um, a group of randomly sourced human sequence antibodies, which Epivax actually um, had in their database. And the lower the number, the better. So um, the adjusted scores are lower than the raw, as you can see. And so those would be predicted to be less immunogenic. Our OmniChicken heavy chains um, are on the right and you can see that um, both the raw and the adjusted scores are within the range of the uh, randomly sourced human sequences. We did the exact same thing for the light chains, um, the kappa and the lambda all together. And on the left again is randomly sourced uh, kappa and lambda from human sources versus the omnichicken human sequences. And again, the the raw scores and the T reg adjusted scores are within the same ranges as the, um, the human. Next, we looked at some biophysical, uh, physiochemical properties in silico with um, this global. And here we compared uh, only the heavy chains. And these are the pre rearranged heavy chains. And on the um, so our, our heavy, we compared to a V region sample of, from plasma cells, um, V sequences from human plasma cells. And we compared our uh, heavy chains either with the, the lambda or the kappa. So that's all sort of broken out here. And um, we looked at aliphaticity, polarity, aromaticity, and the gravy, as I mentioned. And, um, these sort of blobs are the, the, where all of the different, mono, different sequences fall in the, the metrics. And we see that our sequences are all um, 
in the same ranges as the randomly sourced sequences. We did the same analysis for the, um, the rearranging heavy chain transgene, and um, that's shown here, and it basically gives the same, same answer. I should say that the, these uh, randomly sourced human sequences were allele matched, so in the rearranging transgene we have VH323 allele 1 and um, JH6, and the other transgene has VH323 allele 4, and so we allele matched and J matched the, um, the randomly sourced human sequences that we used for comparison. So finally, we looked at the Lake Pharma T20 score, and essentially what Lake Pharma does is they have a database of human sequences that they've curated, and you take your sequence of interest and blast it against their database of thousands of human sequences, and you get um, the top 20 closest hits to your sequence. You take the, the percentage identity of those top 20 and you average the number, and then you get the score. So here on the left is a, um, a graph, a plot of a bunch of different um, antibodies from different species, and uh, the first one is human. So the human-derived sequences score above 80% in their um, assay, which is what you would... That, so they define the 80% cutoff is, as, um, I guess, human enough. Um, the mouse, which is the one next to it, is, is below. And then chicken is in there somewhere too, um, which is also much lower than 80%. So if you look at um, our sequences, we compared individual monoclonal antibody sequences and as, as well as um, NGS data from our, um, from our birds, both uh, the rearranging and the pre-rearranged heavy chains. And those are shown here. So there, everything is over the 80% cutoff. We also compared that to um, V regions from memory cells, naive B cells, and plasma cells from human donors, and uh, those results are here. So those those also um, are mostly above the 80%. And um, this is just broken down for the light chain. So so I would just like to now conclude that. Um, We've analyzed panels of our monoclonal antibodies to the progranulin model protein using the, um, the Cartera instrument and shown that the omni-chicken genotypes all have diverse repertoires that can hit all of the different subdomains. Um, the different genotypes demonstrate bias toward the different epitopes uh, or domains on the protein. And um, the high throughput format of the, the LSA, the Cartera instrument, enables analysis of um, these large panels of clones to very easily and quickly be, be uh, studied. And, and also the, the, kin the kinetics is also um, very nice and robust from the instrument. So, um, and lastly, that the human antibodies from omni-chickens in the three pr uh, parameters we looked at, or the three methods we looked at, are comparable to human-derived sequences. Um, so, that I would like to acknowledge the a lot of work at Ligand Pharmaceuticals by Katie Ching and Kimberly Berg, who discovered and found all of these monoclonal antibodies. Ellen Collarini, who is in, in at the meeting, and Darlene Peterson, who helped a lot in making all the transgenic birds, and our collaborators at Cartera, Yasmin Abdish and Daniel Bettinger, who we've had a wonderful several-year collaboration with, and will continue to have. So thank you very much for your attention. I take questions if you have any.